So we have a very encouraging, strong word for you. I, I saw a picture that's going to apply to some of you personally, and then it's going to apply to, to lineage. Yeah. And so would you say the word flailing? Flailing. flailing. So there, there's, been a, there's been seasons at the lineage where you have felt like you are flailing. Yeah. And, uh, and it's been a season at times of great struggle. I want to submit to you this last season of flailing has been a God-designed season where God is orchestrating something amazing in this church's life and in some of your lives personally, that if you allow yourself to stop flailing and understand and just calm yourselves and trust him, there's a victory, there's miracles, there's power, there's freedom that awaits you. So that's just not a, a sugar-coated promise. I believe that's the real deal. God has something very, very unique for us and for you as a people and lineage in this season as you've been flailing, if you just stop, and hear his voice and calm yourself. There's something just around the corner. And I believe there's an anointing and a double portion, something very unique for this place and this house that awaits you. And for some of you personally, I think there's something very unique. But you got to stop flailing because you're punching the Holy Spirit in the face. And you're, <laughs> and you're knocking people around you out of the way. Yeah. And God would like you to just calm down. Now, keep that in mind, because we're going to close out with that concept. Now, I, 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 I'm an, I, want, I want to be authentic, and I want to be honest. So, I'm, I'm a little bit of a control freak. A anybody? It's true. It's my, my, it's my wife always amens that part. So, I, I, I like my ducks in a row. Anybody? Yeah. And, and who's the person that messes your ducks up the most? Yeah, you're pointing at you're pointing at your, your spouse. Hey, I, I want I want to submit to you. It's God. God messes up your ducks all the time. You line them all up, and God says that's really party, and He just knocks them out of the way because He doesn't want you to trust in your ducks. Some trust in chariots, some in ducks. But we need to rely on the name of the Lord. And because I'm a control freak, in our house, I tend to be the driver in our family. Uh, I prefer driving because, well, one, because nobody drives right. And I just drive right. <laughs> any, any of you out there? We, 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 just, we just drove up from uh, SoCal, and so this is fresh on my mind. I, I'm just going to confess something out loud. I'm that driver that hates to stop because all the cars I passed will pass me. And so I don't like to stop because I'm thinking of the 15 cars that are going to pass me, and then I have to pass them all back. <laughs> I know there's another person in here. I'm not the only one. <laughs> you know, so, so, so when I get back, it's like a competition. And Teresa's like, oh, can't you enjoy it? I said, as soon as I pass that last car back, because we've got to hurry up and stop so that you know, I don't want those cars to get too far ahead. Which, someone say, God help that guy. So, 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 you know, when I'm in my car... I, I, prefer, I prefer driving. I love it. My wife's sitting over here, and, uh, and she, she's a great passenger. I'm not so much a great passenger, but so I, I prefer driving. Now, the problem with life is that when we come to Jesus, he lets us drive our car. And you're like, man, and if you're, if you're in a Pentecostal church, Jesus, you bless me. Take me to places. You come with me and just bless how I drive in Jesus' name, right? <laughs> And Jesus doesn't say anything. He lets you go there. Yeah. So you think he's blessed you. And then you get in a wreck. You get a ticket. And you get mad at Jesus. And Jesus said, you want to drive. So you can enjoy the consequences of your driving. Because God is honorable. You want to run your life? Enjoy the consequences. Or you could change seats with me. Yeah, passenger. Man, I am, I'm not a great passenger. That's not fair. I'm helpful. When I'm a pa I'm very helpful when I'm a passenger. Anybody else on the, as my wife drives, I help her a lot. You, uh, you're following a little closer. You know, you could go faster. Um, did you not want to turn there? My, my wife is really rude. I just want to lay it out there. She's rude. She'll, she'll just look at me and, and she'll say, do you want to drive? Well, no, no, no. I don't want to drive. I just want you to drive right because there's, there's a way to do this, right? And so sitting over here is really hard. And so when Jesus starts driving, I just want to tell you, I'm going to be really honest. I hate the way Jesus drives. 
In, in California, we all know this. So we all know the fast lane. You can go at least nine miles over. We, we know that. There's a grace. Come on, there's a grace. You know there's a grace. The police know there's a grace. It's legal. It's biblical. It's blessed. I mean, so nine miles over. So Jesus gets in the fast lane, and he drives nine miles under. Uh, you, several times you're like, well, you, did you not want to turn there? And Jesus just smiles. Jesus just smiles. I don't know how many times I've said, you know what, can I, can I drive? Because I don't like where you're taking me. I hate how Jesus drives but I love where he takes me. I love where he takes me. And this process of letting go of the wheel, Jesus take the wheel. I mean, no, no, no. Get over here in the passenger side. No, no, Jesus take the wheel. Stay here. And this is the life of surrender. This is the hardest thing for a Christian to do. I've spent most of my life contending for the driver's seat. And Jesus is smiling. He just smiles. Where are you going, Jesus? And he says these annoying words. Trust me. (laughs) What I'm seeing and where you're going, it's really hard for me to believe you're going to take me to a good place. Do you remember the last time we did this, Mike? I do. I love where he took me. Trust me. Would you look at somebody and say, trust Jesus? Oh, come on. This is lineage. I know you guys, you guys vocalize a little bit more. Look at somebody and say, trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. So I, I love Jesus. I love what he's done in my life. I, I did not expect to be the superintendent in the Free Methodist Church. I did not expect to be their superintendent. This was not in our plans at all. Have you ever been in a situation where like, I don't know how in the heck I got here? And God's like, just enjoy the ride because I'm going to take you somewhere. So lineage, you're flailing. You could just stop and say, okay, you're going really slow in the fast lane. You're going the wrong way. So we're going to Southern California, and you took the I-5 north. So I just need to explain to you, Jesus, that's the wrong way. And Jesus says, trust me. Trust me. Would you just say, Jesus, I trust you. I'm going to read you three texts. I'm going to come out of Psalm 107, the first six verses. It says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Am I in the house where you do that? Pastor Benjamin just says, Someone say, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. As a matter of fact, that little phrase, Thank you, Jesus, I probably say it 150 times a day. I mumble it all day long. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I I just mumble it. Thank you, Jesus. Matter of fact, my, my cell phone says it, the little thing on the cell phone. It's the little, it's one of the little, uh, little uh, minions that says, ha, 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 you know, you have a text message, thank you, Jesus. So, <laughs> now, <laughs> it's really annoying after a while, especially when it keeps blowing up. But, but I love the reminder that says, thank you, Jesus. So give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Hard to remember that when you're sitting in the passenger seat. Yeah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So you sit in that passenger seat, you need to say 5,000 times, God loves me, he's taking me to a special place, he's going the wrong way, he's driving way too slow, I have no idea what he's doing, he loves me forever, I believe this is going to work out, I'm just going to close my eyes. (laughs) Whom he has redeemed from the trouble and gathered in the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert ways, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. So have you been delivered? Yeah. Okay, there's one of you. So so you've been a Christian. Have you been delivered? If you've been a Christian, you've all been delivered. You may not be delivered right now, and you're mad because you're not delivered right now, and you forgot that you were delivered before, but you've been delivered. And because you forgot that you've been delivered before, and you don't like the way Jesus is driving, you've gotten back in the driver's seat, and you've made a mess of your life, and you're tanking your car, and you're crashing. And you're mad at Jesus because he won't bless the way you drive. I just want to submit to you, he won't. He won't. He'll let you, but he won't bless the way you drive. He only blesses the way he drives. He wants you to go with him. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, would someone say when? When. 
I love, I love Christianity. We all think that somehow we're going to get to a place that the wind passes away and we're just going to live this victory oh, life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be sick anymore. There's going to be money in the account. It's all going to be good. My kids are going to be perfect. My spouse is going to do everything I wish. And my government's going to be perfect. No. Look at somebody and say, not if, but when. Yeah. So it's no... It's no question, you are going to go through a trial, period. When you pass through the waters, you might be in them right now, some of you are, I will be with you. See, some of you, I'm going to come back to this, some of you, it's, it's, a, it's like a hurricane, you get caught up in the winds, you're blown all over the place, right in the eye of the storm. It's, in the eye of the storm, his name is Jesus. It's why he could be asleep in the middle of a boat, in the middle of a storm in Mark chapter 4. Because he lived in the eye of the storm. Yeah. And Satan tempts you to come out, come out, come out from that eye. Yeah. You're blown away. And then you're mad at God. Yeah. I'll be with you. Somebody say, he's with me. He's with me. And, then, and then through the rivers, they, they, they shall not overwhelm me. I'm good. I can stand because I'm energized and I'm empowered by something far greater than just an intellectual Christianity. The fact that I've just got a few disciplines down, there's something in the spirit of the living God who impregnates me, stands me up, and I can withstand all of the waves. And then when you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. You know, it's that fourth man in the fire. I love that lyric. And the flame shall not consume you. Wouldn't it be amazing to live that way? And some of you have. You've had those moments. Pff, the flame spots off, and you just think, man, I got it all together. And as soon as you think that, it burns you. <laughs> and this is for somebody, Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted, yeah. binds up their wounds. This power of God is also tender. I'm going to take you to Mark chapter 5. We're not going to read the text. We're going to look at verses 21 through 43. Mark is a phenomenal gospel. Mark has the capacity in his gospel to tell story in such a way that he highlights something greater and more significant through the life of Jesus. And so Mark takes these two stories and he does this beautiful thing and he sandwiches these stories together. It's the story of Jairus and his daughter who is sick. It's the story of a woman who's been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. And he puts them together and the story of Jairus is the, is the two slices of bread. Yeah. And right in the middle is this story of this woman that's hemorrhaging blood. Yeah. And so it starts in, in Mark 5, 21, that Jairus, he's a, he's a ruler of the synagogue, so he's got some prestige. He's got some place, and he's going to use that prestige and place to get to the rabbi. So he makes his way to the rabbi. The rabbi is, he's just surrounded by people. He's a healer. He's got great words. Everybody wants to see Jesus. Yeah. Everybody wants to get healed by Jesus. He gets, his, he gets an audience with Jesus, and he says to Jesus, my daughter is not well. Would you come? And Jesus says the word that everyone wants to hear. Yes, I'd be glad to come. So he begins to make his way. Now you can imagine, here's the disciples, they're clearing people, make room for the rabbi, make room for the rabbi, get out of the way, get out of the way. And people are just crawling, trying to get to Jesus. They want to touch him. There's this woman who's been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. She has spent all she has. You got, you got Jairus who's got reputation. She has no reputation. She can't touch anybody, as Pastor Benjamin said. She, if she does, she will make them unclean. She wants to sneak through the crowd and touch the rabbi so he doesn't know that she's made him unclean. He believes, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, something will happen. So everybody's touching Jesus. I want you to imagine this. Disciples are pushing people out of the way, and people are trying to get to Jesus, and Jairus is he's muscling his way through with his entourage. They're trying to get home because his daughter is very ill. This woman makes her way through the crowd somehow. I mean, I'd like to see the video when I get there. How do, you, how do you get through? So she finagles her way, and she touches Jesus. And then Jesus does the weirdest thing. It's like he's driving his car, and he stops on the freeway. Yeah. And he says, who touched me? <laughs> right. Everybody? Can you imagine? And he says, no, no, no. Power left me. Something happened. Now, the woman's sneaking away. So, so she comes. She's a, she's a nobody. 
And then Jesus takes nobody, just to preach, turns her into a somebody. <laughs> Isn't that good? So there's a nobody. And now she's somebody touched me. And then, and then this somebody finally turns around and it's his daughter, little woman. Nobody to somebody to a woman. He brings her into the fold in one instance. Your faith has healed you. Yay for her. Bummer for Jairus. Entourage comes to Jairus and says, hey, um, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. I'm going to get really honest. You ever been in a church service where people are giving their testimonies? They get healed of cancer, and you're like, I'm dying. My husband came. Mine's with the fourth girl. Your story doesn't match their story, and you feel like, why bother the teacher anymore? It's over. Now, maybe you're not going to backslide. Maybe you're not going to fall away from the faith, but you're done. Pretty much done. My faith is minimal. God blesses everyone but me. And Jesus, he's driving. He gets weird again. He said, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. Right. No, I think she's dead. He makes his way anyway. Now they're pushing, they're getting there. And when he gets there, there's the professional mourners. You hired professional mourners. And they're wailing. Ah! They're all crying. And they've been crying because they're mourning the death of this little girl. And Jesus again says, she's not. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. See, our problem is you and I tend to have faith based on the circumstances of our life and not in him. And when you look at the circumstances, the way he's driving, you will not like where you're going. And you will complain, and you will get frustrated, you'll get angry, and you'll say to Jesus, I'm taking over the car. Because you don't know how to do this. Remember, I hate the way Jesus drives. Love where he takes me. But in order for that to happen, i got to keep my mouth shut. Might need to get a little praise on. If I don't get any praise on, I'll just keep my mouth shut. Just sit there and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. So he gets there, and Jesus obviously raises this little girl. And God is so economical. Not only does he raise her from the dead, he heals her. So he, on his way, he's so economical. I'm going to heal a woman. I'm going to bring her into the fold. I'm going to heal her from being excluded from the community. Her hemorrhaging blood's going to be gone. She's going to be fully restored. God's going to bring her back on my way. I'm going to heal the daughter of her sickness while I raise her from the dead. Just a day's, just a day's work. So I'm here to tell you this morning, God has a lot more for you Amen. than what you believe. And there's just three simple words of hope that he gives in that passage. And it's a simple word of faith. He says, do not fear, just go on believing. Would you look at somebody and say, don't fear? Don't fear. Keep, don't fear. On Keep, on Keep on believing. Some rock group made that song popular. <laughs> don't stop believing, I think is what they said. <laughs> but I don't think that's what they meant. That's what we mean. <laughs> faith trusts not in the circumstances. Trust in him. Yeah. And the word of hope. So what, what, why are you making a commotion? Mike, would you, would you just hope in me? Would you trust me as I'm driving? But you, the landscape looks wrong. Trust me. But she's dead. Trust me. But my, my, my spouse has left. I lost my kid. I lost my job. Trust me. But I, I don't understand. I don't understand. Trust me. Yeah. Hardest thing to do as a believer is trust him when it's dark. Yeah. And then there's the word of love and power, Telethai Kumi, little girl. I will, I, I'm going to play this video when I get to heaven. Little girl, get up. Yeah. And can you imagine? <laughs> and she sits up. And you can imagine, Jairus. There might have been a little praise in that house that day. So I want to suggest to you the key to all of this is a really, really hard word. I'm going to say it to you. Ready? It's brokenness. Would you say brokenness? Brokenness. Yeah, we hate that word. We hate that word. So what is brokenness? I'm going to walk you through this. Hang with me. Brokenness involves a broken and contrite heart. Psalm 51, 17. Yeah. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. I don't mean broken like depressed broken. Broken in the sense that it's yielded. Would you say yielded? Yielded. So we come into this world. When you are born into this world, you come in crying and you clench your fists. 
Brokenness is the process that God opens your hands. Yeah. See, most of you come to God like this. Yeah. Lord, I bless you. And you're shouting and you're praying. And God's like, I can't give you anything because you've got some fists. Augustine said it this way. We come to God with our hands full of things, good works, all our stuff, and we leave with them empty. It'd be so much better to come empty. Yeah. And you'd leave with them full. All brokenness is is the process for you to open your hands. To move from the driver's seat to the passenger seat. So living hope where you've been, lineage, all this history, you've been here flailing, moving. You can just sort of calm down and say, okay, reality is she's dead. I've lost my job. I got cancer. This has happened. But I'm going to trust my God because this is fertile soil for the miraculous. This is where God does his best. Yeah if we'll trust him in it. So brokenness is the process where we learn to open our hands before death. So I'll give you some text. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. The word broken in, in Hebrew is shabar. It means to burst, to break in pieces, crush, tear. Sounds horrible. It's not. The word contrite in Psalm 51, 17, the Hebrew word is daka. It means crumble, bruise, humble, or smite. Sounds terrible. It's not. It's a process by which God, please hear this, makes you soft. Would you say the word soft? soft. See, what, what, you, what God is is a potter and you are the clay and life makes you hard and brittle. And what he does, he ends up getting snapped and broken. But the process of brokenness is where the water of the word and trials and the fires of life come and soften you. And all of a sudden you become moldable in the hand of God and you stop driving. And once you stop driving, the power and the flow of God is in your life in a way that makes you radiate and makes you draw people to him. And you live in a sense of abundance and fluidness that is incredible and powerful. So broken or wounded, let me give you the difference. Because some of you are thinking, well, that sounds like you're a wounded person. No, 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 broken is good. Someone say broken is good. So brokenness is that place where we realize and accept that all the things in life that we counted on to work, don't. When you finally get to the place like, yeah, I get my money right, but it still doesn't do what I need. I can get get my body right, and it still doesn't do what I need. I can get everything right, and still something's missing because you're supposed to seek first his kingdom. So the result, if you are broken, the result, the individual, oh, this is so good, someone's got to shout, the individual becomes bigger than the problem. So here's how it works. From a distance, Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. You can't defeat him, you can't defeat him. I'm small. You take a step, nine feet, three inches. Take another step, eight feet, five inches. Take another step, he's six foot, two inches. He's still taller than I am. Eventually, when you get right up to him, he's only nine inches tall. <laughs> and as a Christian, you stop. And you now have the victory. The individual becomes bigger than the problem because the presence of God is in your life. And that person, like the Apostle Paul, is unstoppable. Because what are you going to do to me? Kill me to live as Christ, to die as gain, whatever. I, my life is his. So I don't always, I still don't like how we drive. So I, I, mean, I still like, really? 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 Yeah. Okay. I've been doing this a long time. It's going to be good. The road might be tough. Yeah. There might be some trials. Yeah. There might be some rivers. There might be some fires. There might be some wind. Yeah. But I know you're good. Amen. And I know this Goliath that looks really big right now won't be by the time I get to him because you're going to make me bigger. My mentor used to say it to me this way, Mike, you're a five-gallon saint right now, and God has a 10-gallon task for you, so he's making you bigger. Now, that also, that's that preaches. It feels terrible. (laughs) Can you, can you do that and make it not hurt so much? Woundedness is that place where we continue to try and make life work, enhancing our pain, frustration, and stress, and we inflict the same onto others. That's the difference between the two. The individual, please hear me, becomes part of the problem. Broken, you become bigger 
wounded, you're part of it. That's yeah. Satan's game. He gets you to contribute to your demise. You're wrecking the car. You're mad at Jesus. You're getting the tickets. You're mad at Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you're driving. You wanted to drive. I will release you with all honor to do with your life what you want. Or you can trust me. Which is why I wrote the book, Radically Living, Quietly Dying, because I got radically saved at 13, tried to kill myself at 16. I didn't, I didn't just try. We're talking knife to the chest. I was starting to stab myself. God stopped me. I won't tell you the story. It's in the book. 22, second time. I'd met my wife at this time. She wasn't my wife at the moment. I'm in youth ministry. Our group's going like crazy. We're doing good. Life is good. I'm hurting on the inside. I'm going to try to run my car off the road. We live in Oregon, full of trees. I can't find a tree to hit. I'm going 120 miles an hour flying through the gears. What the heck is a tree? I can't find a tree. And the Lord's talking to me. He shows me a picture. You're going to crash the car and roll it. You're going to be severely injured. You're going to be in the hospital. And you're going to have to explain to all your youth group kids what you just did. So it's like, man, I'm so angry. 31, I'm pastoring in Southern California, growing church, Newport Beach. And for multiple nights, I'm counseling a boatload of people. I got a gun to my head. I'm walking five people through suicide watch. They get free. I got a gun to my head. Who am I going to talk to? Um, hey, Pastor, you doing all right? No, I tried to kill myself last night, but life's good. <laughs> Who do I tell? So shame. Shame. Every single one of you struggles with shame. You all get it from your first parents, Adam and Eve. Your parents gave you a particular kind of shame and fear. Now, some of them are good Good parents, we still pick up a shame. Your pastor said these first two lines in a conversation I had with him years ago. And you've probably heard him say, the shame is the power that pulls you into the past where you relive the failures of your former self. Ouch. Fear is the power that pulls you into the future where you prelive the failures of your future self. Here's the unholy trinity. Anxiety is the bonding agent that seals you to the shame of your past while it inflates the fear of your future. That's where everybody lives. And hell just wants to play that. You go back and forth between yeah. shame and fear with anxiety. Yeah. And you're so worried that that's going to happen again. Yeah. So you keep it trapped and hidden, which is what keeps us from being broken. Yeah. And we stay wounded because it's really hard to let this little person out. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, the way to get access to all that's in the kingdom, Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. The key that unlocks the door to the kingdom store. So yeah. say there's a, key. there's a key. There's a key. I just gave it to you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not like I'm poor, I suck, I'm terrible. No, no, no. <laughs> I choose dependence on Jesus. Yeah. It's not like I'm just going to constantly just self-flagellate. No, no, no. I choose dependence on Jesus. When I choose dependence on Jesus, it, that key goes right into that lock and yeah. click. It opens up. I have access to everything in the kingdom store. Yeah. Say everything. 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 But you got to be poor in spirit, which means you got to sit over here. Yeah. And when you sit here, you will work through all of your issues. Yeah. Mine stem back to the time I was eight years old, sitting in the passenger seat of a 1968 Oldsmobile 88. Some of you have no idea what that is. Some of you all know what that is. Midnight blue, white rag top. My Asian-ness, I was born in South Korea, comes from my mother. My non-English nose, American side comes from my dad. My dad was a devout alcoholic, womanizer, and abuser, joy. So he said to me, Mike, you're a pretty good looking boy. My, my athletic prowess in fourth grade had just surfaced. I was a dork before that, serious dork. You would not pick me. I was always pick last. So for those of you who've been pick last, that feels terrible. So, so I just blossomed, and all of a sudden, I'm the fastest kid in the class. I'm like, I'm a stud. I'm the dude. And I, my dad says he wants to talk to me. So I'm thinking, it's, it's the conversation. I'm going to hear the words. So I'm waiting. I'm just anticipating. 
Yeah, you're pretty good looking boy, son. If you just had your almond shaped eyes operated on, made round like mine, you'd be a great looking kid. So you don't like my slanted eyes. Remember the, I remember, some of you don't understand this. When you've been injured, you can remember every detail. So I said out loud to my dad, um, in a voice I could barely utter, I'll do whatever you want, if you'll love me. That day set in motion, performance mic. Wow. Wow. I'm gonna win my dad, and I'm gonna win you. And every Sunday, I gotta preach the best sermon in the entire world, or you won't come back. That's what I believed for years. And what I hated, Pastor Ben, when someone would come up and they said to me, you know, Pastor, we're just not being fed here. Really? Where's a pair of chopsticks? Eat. I mean, you don't know how to eat? What do you mean not being fed? How long have you been a Christian? 25 years? And you don't know how to eat? What do you mean not being fed? <laughs> so so I, I'd have that attitude, but the one that really stuck was this one. They saw you, and they all know you're not good enough. See, that's the lie. My problem is I look in the mirror, and there I am. I'm Asian. I'm drawn to rice and kimchi. I can't get rid of it. I'm Asian. I love bulgogi. I'm Asian. So what do I do? Thank God that these eyes were never operated on. But here's the dilemma. Hell's going to get you to not be broken because to be broken, you got to enter your shame. So you try to get healed and you remain wounded while you're driving your car trying to get fixed, going to every seminar out there, reading every book, getting prayed over, having demons cast out of you multiple times, and you're still struggling. And then Satan says, ain't nothing left for you to do. You suck. Which is where I lived until I finally said I'm done. So I have not been suicidal for 32 years. And again, I... I'm not thinking about it. I tried three times. So I want to say this. The day it broke, I'm by myself. My wife's at work, 7.30 in the morning. I, got, I have counseling appointments from 8 in the morning to 9 at night. I'm bringing healing to everybody but me. So I'm sitting there, and I, I don't know if you ever felt like this, Pastor Benjamin. Maybe you've never felt like this. I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I'm eating my oatmeal like I don't got anything to say. I'm struggling with dying. I'm depressed. But I'm faking it because I'm, I, I sounded like this, so I present well. But quietly, I'm not doing well. Radically living, quietly dying. And I, get, I can get my shout on with anybody, but it was hard to shout by myself. Yeah. So I'm sitting at the table, and I'm just struggling. I don't want to go in. And for the first time in my life, I had shouted, I had rebuked, I had cast out whatever spirit, whatever minion. I've done everything. But that day, for the first time, I think I actually traded places with Jesus. I got up out of the driver's seat. I walked over here, and I, and I stood up in my table in the kitchen. And I, sorry, I'm going to get loud. I slapped the table, and I said, no! And then I looked at, like, Satan standing right there, and I said, I am done with you. I can't live this way. I refuse to live this way, and I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I have no idea what that means, and we're done. I'm going to work. I'm going to counsel, and I'm going to have victory, and I don't know how I'm going to do it. And I sat down, and that spirit left that day and hasn't bothered me since. So... What did I do different, Lord? I mean, I've shouted like that before. Change seats with me, son. Change seats. So I stay in this seat now because I don't like that other mic because he's dark. Watchman Nee tells a story. He was a wonderful Chinese pastor, and there was a group of them traveling, and they stayed at a house, and the house didn't have adequate plumbing for everybody. And so they had to bathe in the river, so they went to the river to bathe, and all the guys were bathing. And one of them got a cramp in his leg, and he went under. And he was far away from the group, and close by him was the one who was the most excellent swimmer. But the most excellent swimmer paid him no attention. And Watchman Nee, like most Christians, got a little frantic and yelled at the brother, help our brother, he's going under, do you not see? And the guy didn't even flinch, didn't even move. Didn't even respond. So Watchman Nee now is getting upset. 
getting deeply concerned. The guy's going up and down, up and down. And eventually the guy goes completely under. Now the guy that's closest to him flips around in one moment, takes about three or four quick strokes because he's an excellent swimmer, goes over, takes the guy and saves him and brings him ashore. Well, watch Mene being the wonderful Christian that he is, has to come to this wonderful Christian man who just saved the guy and he's gonna give him a piece of his mind. And he basically says to him, how in the world could you be such a selfish Christian? How could you sit out there and just mm, you're doing your thing while our brother is struggling? Why, why did you not respond? Why did you not help him? I've never seen a more self-centered Christian than you. Here's what the man said. Had I gone earlier, he would have clutched me so fast that both of us would have gone under. A drowning man cannot be saved until he is utterly exhausted and ceases to make the slightest effort to save himself. It's a lineage. Flailing. You are knocking away the very people God's trying to bring to you. Nobody's here to help me. <coughs> Eventually, people start to do this, and you think Satan's saying to you, nobody cares about you. Matter of fact, they care deeply. They're just waiting for you to go under. 32 years ago, I finally went under. Oh, no. Oh. A slanted eyes means that I'm not worth anything. God's going to let me die. I'm done. <laughs> Strong right hand came in the water, pulled me out. And now I know my slanted eyes are beautiful. And love and kimchi is right. <laughs> you got to go under. Hardest thing to do. Getting saved is wonderful. Going under is another process. And those who go under are the most flexible and soft and fluid people in, in the kingdom. Because we now know that no matter how crazy Jesus drives, how fast, how slow, how many wrong turns, he goes the wrong way. I mean, you know the wilderness wrongings, right? 40 years, 38 years, 9 months to go basically what would have taken 11 days. And let's give it two or three months. So you added basically 39 years to a journey? Someone say slow. Is that because they wrestled? I suspect that some of you have taken 10 years because you've been resisting God. You could have been healed in one. Some of you are on 20 years and you're still struggling. You could have been healed in three. Here's God's kindness. I'm going to wait you out. And if you ever go under, you'll experience for the first time my hand that will save you. And then you can go and spit in Satan's face and walk down the corridors of hell, proclaim release to the captives, and here's what. Hell can't stop you. What's he going to tell me? God doesn't love you. You're not good enough. I'm a victorious mess. Whatever. You got slanted eyes. I love him. My wife loves him. You know what? And God made me his masterpiece. So I want to glorify him the way that I am and live to be the son that he created me to be. Amen. So I want to pray for you. Can you stand up? I think lineage is in a power pack season. I think your flailing in the last couple of years oddly has been God orchestrated. Not because he wants to harm but he wants us to change places so that it's not our shout, it's not our intelligence, it's not the magnetism. We have a dynamic preaching couple here. We have great gifting in this church. It's about surrendered vessels who live the healing and fullness. See, in this house, there's a powerful sense of this healing release where demons actually flee. And, and there's resistance from hell because hell doesn't want you ever to walk in that fully. You've tasted it. You've had moments. But then we flail. And God says, can I drive the car lineage? Can I drive the car son and daughter? Can I take you to a place? You'll love the place. You'll hate the journey. But in the journey, pieces of your flesh will fall off. And the hardness will disappear. And out will come the boy, the son. Out will come the girl, the daughter that I've made. And you'll stand in radiance and you'll realize you are much larger than any Goliath that God has 
placed in front of you or Satan's trying to bring against you because you will have victory. You'll have victory. So I'm going to ask you in a quiet moment, this is not a shout moment, there's some of you here that you need a, you need a deep touch. You've been flailing. And, and I don't know what it is about church where we act like we're okay. I mean, we got to get our praise on. We tell people, and it would be so nice if you just came in and, how you doing? And I'm sucking air. <laughs> How's your time with the Lord? It's not happening. Yeah, I'm praying, but it's cold. I don't feel anything. I'm mad at God. I'm disappointed. I'm envious. People have their stories. I'm just coming to church because I'm waiting for something to happen. Why is it that we just can't say that? Well, because you know I've been around those Christians who judge the snot out of us when we do. Well, is your faith weak? Come on, just believe. And I'm trying with all that I got. I don't have any more. And God says, good, go under. One last, one last, one last shot. Go under. Some of you are tired, but here's the lie. I'll be the exception. When I go under, God will let me drown. I just want to tell you, you are not that special. <laughs> there is no VIP suck person in this room. You are not that special. Would you just say, I'm not that special? So Satan's trying to make you that special on the wrong side. You are special on the other side. God will save you. He has no respecter of persons. You are his son. You are his daughter. So we can have 12 kids. Some of you have lots of kids. You'd save them all. You'd even save them all with the worst attitude. You might let them stay on for just a little longer, but you'd still save them. Wouldn't you? Doesn't matter. God will save you, but you're going to have to go under it, and you know what that means. So I'm going to ask you to start praying with a clenched fist and then open it. And I want you to open it, and I want you to turn it over, and I want you to let go of what you're holding on to. Some of you, it's unforgiveness. Some of you, it's fear. Some of it's anger. Some of you feel like you've been chided by God, and, and he doesn't care. Some of you feel like you'll never be anything. Some of you believe that you don't amount to anything, and you're trying to prove something that you don't need to prove. Some of you are trying to get into a room you're already in. You're in the room. So Jesus, we come right now. Sweet Holy Spirit. And Lord, I can see that some of your sons and daughters have been flailing for a while. We, we feel like Jairus, someone else took our healing. Some woman came in and took it. And we're wondering what to do with this death, this loss that's in front of us, this future that now looks bleak without the hope of a person, of, of a job, of a career, or a calling. And so some of us just stopped. Don't be afraid. Keep on believing. But well, we started believing a lie, not the truth. We started looking at our circumstances. We looked at where you were driving in the landscape, and the landscape looked like a desert. And you were telling us you were going to take us to a, a promised land, and it all looked bleak. So we asked you to pull over so we could drive, or we just got out of the car. And Lord, today's the day that I believe for some, they just need to go under and feel your hand come and pull them out. So I want to rebuke every lie. I want to stand against every tormenting spirit, every minion that's been speaking into the ears of people, even while I've been preaching. This isn't for you. It's never going to happen for you. It's a lie. Father, you will save them. You have a, 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 you have a place for them and a, and a purpose. Father, you have a future for them. Your, your, your plans for us are not evil. They're not to harm. Father, they're to bring out the, the, the best that's in us in Christ to, to the fullness of who we are as a son and daughter so that we might live in the, in the eye of the storm so that all of the struggles of life will somehow bounce off. Even though, even though, Lord, we may sweat and we may struggle and we may get hot and it may hurt. Father, there's victory and every Goliath can be undone. And we give you praise right now in the name of Jesus. Would you just put your hands together? Hallelujah.